So when late Paleozoic uh, time began, then what we're looking at is the end of uh, Pennsylvania and beginning of Permian. Our re this region that we're looking at, the Pacific Northwest, uh, what we consider today the Pacific Northwest, was still the partly submerged fringe uh, on the western edge of that uh, of the coalescing supercontinent uh, Pangaea. So at this time, Pangaea is starting to come together. Uh, it's uh, coming together in two parts, the northern part uh, being called Lower Asia and the southern part being uh, called Gond Gondwana land. And uh, everything west of the old continental margin, which was along the western boundary of uh, Idaho and down into central Nevada, uh, was open ocean. And large parts of the continental interior to the east were submerged under shallow seawater. So we had um, mountains that were running along the edge of the continental shelf there, I mean, the continental margin, uh, which would have been the edge of the craton. To the west, we have oceans. To the east, we have uh, shallow empiric seas or shallow seas that are less than 100 meters uh, uh, deep. And the, the waters were separated by the remnants of what uh, has been called the antler orogeny. And the antler orogeny got started oh, sometime in the Devonian period of time. And it's a very controversial mountain range. We're not real sure. Uh, there's only one little bit of the Robert, I mean, of the uh, antler mountains left, and that's the Robert Mountains, I believe, which is in. Uh, New Mexico, if I'm not mistaken. And <clears throat> the Antler Mountains stretch from central Nevada through Idaho and into British Columbia. Maybe it's in Nevada. Uh, I believe the Roberts Mountains are in Nevada now. Uh, offshore to the west, island arcs were similar to the Aleutian Islands. So what you're looking at here are the Aleutian Islands. Uh, shown in this image, we're moving southeastward to eventually collide with the old continental margin. Excuse me, uh, Gilbert. Um, yeah, we're just seeing the uh, your opening slide. That we're not seeing whatever it is you're pointing. I think to that's over. where we are. We're still on the opening slide. Oh, okay. Pardon me. So what we're looking at here is uh, we had a series of volcanic islands that were uh, offshore, uh, and what we were looking at is very similar to what we're looking at in this screen. In other words, there was a series of volcanic islands off to the west where uh, was a waterway and then to the right of that was a waterway that goes uh, back to the continental margin itself. I don't know why that's not working. Here we go. So by the beginning of the Mesozoic era, which is uh, the Mesozoic is Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous period, it's the middle, uh, middle time, uh, all the continents had united to form the supercontinent Pangaea. So that's what we're looking at here on the left with Laurasia on the top, North America and Europe and Asia combined together, and then Gondwana, which was South America, uh, Africa, uh, India, uh, the Antarctic, and Australia made up Gondwana. Uh, for tens of millions of years, the Earth had one hemisphere that was mostly continental and the other almost entirely oceanic. Uh, the continent of Pangaea was nearly divided by the Tethys Ocean, which is this area right through here, is the Tethys Ocean. And of course, all this area we're looking at right through here is the Tethys Ocean. Everything else was called the Panthalassa Ocean. Uh, this was this area right out through here is uh, the western margin of the Craton, and these uh, are the remnants of the Roberts Mountains. And then this is the, uh, I mean, of the uh, uh, Antler Orogeny, and then these are the the shallow Epiric Seaways that are between that and the edge of the continents. Uh, <coughs> Approaching from the west were the exotic terrains that would eventually form uh, Northern California, Oregon, and Washington, Western British Columbia, and parts of Alaska. 
the reptiles and amphibians of the early Triassic that could have roamed across Laura Asia, uh, certainly could have started all the way out in, in the Asian portion of, uh, Eura of Laura Asia, went all the way by land across Laura Asia to the west coast of uh, North America, and then traveled all the way down through Gondwana, uh, through uh, South America, and out up into Australia over in this area right through here. So it won the one huge continent and it was easy for the animals to traverse and it was easy for uh, uh, different species to uh, uh, come into being because of the, uh, of the new land mass and, and the open, uh, openness of it allowed uh, uh, speciation to occur. Uh, Permian and Triassic times or periods saw huge deposits of red uh, sandstone and shells accumulated on dry land uh, throughout Pangaea. By looking at the geology, we can determine the environments of dep uh, deposition for those continental sediments. So here we're looking at uh, this sandy area right here is uh, sandstone, which would have been the beach face itself. Uh, this was back uh, behind Montana right through here. This area through here is a portion of Montana. Uh, so this would have been uh, essentially the same thing as a marsh uh, environment here. Uh, this would have been a very shallow uh, 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 muds deposited in this area. And as, uh, as we find in this area through here. And this uh, area right here is uh, more marine and shallow gray. Uh, 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 gray uh, slates were found in this area here. So the, all this area through here was mostly very shallow, uh, warm water deposits that were uh, oxidized and, and essentially red in color. Uh, so at no time before or since has so much iron stained sediments been laid down. It was uh, here we see the Mesozoic sedimentary beds deposited in the Bighorn Basin of northern Wyoming. Uh, most geologists agree that the pervasive Triassic sediments uh, indicate a warm and dry climate. So the question is, what does the color red indicate in sandstones and shale? And that's not rhetorical, I'm actually asking that. So if you have uh, an answer to that, I'd like to hear. What do you think calls these red, uh, uh, yeah, Luke? Iron oxide. Uh Iron, um, yeah. Okay, so uh, the iron, uh, the oxidation of the iron, right? Uh, and believe it's yeah, good. that's what I, I would guess. Yeah, and that is the reason why. So what that does is it indicates very either terrestrial deposits or uh, continental deposits themselves on land or terrestrial deposits uh, or fluvial deposits or lacustrine deposits or very uh, which are lake deposits or very shallow seawater deposits. Anything that uh, waters could be very, very well oxygenated or land uh, ex exposed on the land surface itself. Um, so geo geoscientists have determined three reasons why the climate was dry uh, during Permian and Triassic time. Um, the first one is that most of the vast interior Pangaea was far from the ocean's uh, moist winds. In other words, the continent was so big that uh, no weather systems could, uh, uh, moisture could get past the huge mountains. Uh, let's backtrack and you can see some of the huge mountains that were around at that time. So here, all through here, uh, you're looking at the Appalachian Mountains uh, and down in, uh, that actually went from about this area right here all the way through here and eventually joined into uh, uh, this mountain chain running down into Gondwana land. Uh, so all this area through here was just vast. We're talking a huge area that was uh, uh, far inland and very dry as we are looking down at Gondwana. All this very inland area was very dry and uh, very much in desert type of conditions. Uh, the second reason is that higher carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, may have caused a world high, worldwide greenhouse effect. 
So by the combination of all the uh, continents coming together and slamming together, we had a lot of volcanism that was going on during this time. And volcanoes pump out a lot of CO2. Uh, and uh, and uh, as a result of that CO2, uh, we had rising levels of CO2, much like we do today, and caused warming of the of the uh, uh, of the planet itself, just like we're experiencing to get, uh, today. So, uh, if we want to kind of have an idea of what was going on at that time. Uh, all we have to do is look at what's going on today and have a, a better feel for what's going on then. Or if we want to see what may happen for us in the future, uh, we can study what happened during the Permian and Triassic through the uh, early Jurassic of, uh, of uh, Pangaea and see what uh, occurred on the, uh, in the rocks during that period of time. And we can have a pretty good indication of where we might be headed. Uh, and then the third reason is that during the Mesozoic, the Pacific Northwest was not far from the equator, and the trade winds uh, were blowing off the dry interior of Pangaea. So we had uh, the warm uh, currents uh, that were blowing westerly so off of um, uh, and through uh, North America coming off the Appalachian Mountains to the right or to the east over here and blowing across this area which aided to, uh, aided uh, uh, desert conditions in uh, the Pacific Northwest. All this makes sense because many of the sandstone formations contain cross beds or dunes. Uh, and let me go back to the slide we were on. Uh, this all makes sense because of many of the sandstone formations contain uh, cross beds or dunes that indicate desert environments. Uh, most streams were sediment choked and were unable to efficiently transport sediments to the ocean. And a good many of the terrestrial uh, formations contain salt and gypsum. So what we're looking at here are uh, sandstones that are indicative of cross bedding. And so that's, you see how this is, um, Kind of a swooping uh, upwards uh, 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 bedding in this uh, uh, formation is very, uh, very much indicative of of sand dunes itself. So as this, uh, as this above, uh, or also. So in this case, the wind was blowing from the left and going to the right, uh, and in this case, right through here, it was blowing from the right to the left, and then again up here, we had reverse winds going back to the other direction. So we can actually see which ways the sands were traveling at that point in time, and um, uh, which helps us understand what the climate and the conditions on lands were, were like. Uh, by that point in time, of course, we did have a lot of vegetation on the planet, uh, except in the desert areas. So along the margins in the marshy areas or along the, uh, the uh, ocean sides of any mountains, uh, we had a lot of precipitation that was occurring. So uh, vegetation was um, 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 growing uh, well in those areas, and especially in the marshy areas, we had um, um, very uh, uh, kind of a palm-like uh, trees that were growing uh, and that grew rapidly and uh, was um, um, led to the formation of coal deposits and uh, other things like that. By Jurassic time, so here we are, we've already jumped to Jurassic, we started in uh, Pangaea started in early Permian, or some people think late Pennsylvanian, uh, but for our purposes, uh, early Permian, late Pennsylvanian, early Permian, uh, and it lasted until uh, early Jurassic. And by that time, uh, Pangaea was pretty well starting to break apart. And uh, the Western continental margin had existed for about 600 million years. Uh, as a passive margin. So here, this area over here, and we've been still, you know, talking a lot about passive margins that occur. Uh, this is uh, still that is the case. Uh, but by the time at the end of Triassic, or uh, 
And beginning of Jurassic, we started having a new trench that developed along the western edge of uh, North America. So before uh, it was passive, but now we've gone into an active mode because we have subduction occurring along the western uh, shores of uh, North America. Uh, the problem is we don't know which way the subduction was going. <laughs> Some people think that the subduction was going to uh, subducting to the east. Others uh, push for the argument that subduction was to the west. Uh, so uh, it's still kind of a controversial question. Uh, here's another good example over here of the Appalachian Mountains that were uh, erected during the uh, when Africa smashed into uh, and uh, into uh, North America, uh, developed that. Uh, these are the Washita Mountains through here, and then the uh, part of uh, uh, the uh, uh, southern, uh, I guess the southern uh, uh, Rocky Mountains. Uh, early Rocky Mountains were established in this area, and these are ancestral Rocky Mountains here. Uh, the other thing to note that is that all the drainage was to the west, as you can see here. So all the river systems at that time were draining to the west, uh, all the way across most of North America, all the way up into Canada. Everything was draining to the west and towards the uh, uh, path of Lassa Ocean on the, uh, uh, on the west. So this margin on the west here had accumulated about 6,000 feet of sediments during all those years to form a broad coastal plain in the continental shelf. Uh, we don't have broad co uh, coastal plains along the west coast today, but they're found uh, uh, mainly today from New York south and along the Gulf of Mexico. So if you kind of wonder what a, a uh, coastal plain and a passive margin look like, uh, all you have to do is, is travel to the east coast and, uh, and uh, look out there or just look at uh, any uh, bathymetric map and you'll see that the uh, eastern side of, the, of North America has a very wide continental shelf, whereas the western side or the active portion of uh, North America has very uh, narrow uh, continental shelves. Uh, Pangaea was actually relatively short-lived and, and had pretty much broken up uh, into the, our modern continents that we recognize today uh, with oceans separating them by the end of Triassic. Uh, first to separate was Gondwana that contained the uh, continents India, Australia, Antarctica, uh, I mean Antarctica, uh, South America, and Africa. And by early Jurassic, uh, Laurasia had broken apart into North America and Eurasia. Any questions so far? Oh, by the way, I, I've uh, had quite a few good uh, questions and discussions going uh, by email today, and I really appreciate those questions. They were very good questions. and. Uh, I really appreciate you sending uh, questions like that, uh, that I can have time to answer, answer you properly and give you good answers for those, uh, those questions. So thank you once again for uh, emailing me. Uh, but if you have a question that uh, may be a large question that might be a little difficult to explain during class, uh, save it to either, either after class or before class or uh, shoot me an email and I'll do my best to answer any questions that you might have uh, concerning our topic. Uh, the Atlantic Ocean had been widening and diverging since early Jurassic. So beginning with the breakup of um, North America from uh, Europe, uh, we started with a, a, a doming due to heating underneath that portion of the continent. Uh, the heating caused uh, the, uh, uh, the earth above it, the crust above it, or the lithosphere above it to stretch and thin. And by stretching and thinning, uh, it's like pulling taffy uh, apart. Uh, it breaks, and when it breaks, it breaks into normal faults. 
and we get uh, a rift valley developed and then eventually it keeps uh, rifting and breaking, uh, moving further and further apart or diverging apart. And eventually we end up with uh, uh, seaways flooding into the uh, rift zones. And then over time, as it continues to widen, uh, it eventually becomes oceans. And uh, the Atlantic Ocean was born as a result of, of uh, rifting along that same uh, eastern margin where uh, Europe and Africa had uh, uh, slammed into North America. So that was a zone of weakness to begin with, and then with the heating and the crustal thinning, uh, it started breaking apart again, and as a result, the divergent zone that we recognize today as the Mid-Atlantic uh, Mid Ridge was uh, developed. And for the next 180 million years, it's been pushing apart uh, North America to and the North American plate to the uh, to the west northwest and the European plate to the uh, east and northeast uh, and at the same time the um, uh, uh, at this particular time uh, during um, after the breakup of uh, Pangaea uh, we were the plate that was diving under the western portion of North America was called the Farallon Plate. Uh, and the Farallon Plate was a very massive plate uh, that stretched uh, all the way from uh, Alaska all the way uh, down uh, to about uh, a third of the way down into um, uh, uh, South America and stretched oceanward probably about a thousand kilometers, if not more. So it's a very large plate and it's uh, uh, being pushed uh, towards the uh, east uh, at, uh, at, the, uh, at a divergent zone that separated the Farallon plate from the Pacific plate at that time. So was the Farallon plate subducting under the Pacific plate or under the North American plate? The Farallon plate was subducting underneath North American plate, and it, well, and part of the uh, at that time part of the South American plate as well. So okay. it's a very, very large uh, oceanic plate. Does any part of it still exist? Yes, uh, very little. Uh, there's the I don't know if you're familiar with the Farallon Islands in uh, in the Bay of San Francisco, or out just out. Uh, off shore, actually, uh, uh, in, at the mouth of uh, San Francisco Bay is the Farallon Islands, and it's really one of the last remnants of it. And actually, the Juan de Fuca is a uh, uh, had been renamed because the plate had become so small that it it and separated from uh, the rest of the plate that it was changed to the Juan de Fuca. Uh, plate. So very, very little of that original plate uh, is existing anymore. Also, the orientation of the Juan de Fuca plate had changed quite a bit uh, from the orientation of the Farallon plate. Uh, and then uh, to the south, it would, uh, um, the Nazca plate would have uh, been part of that uh, particular plate. Uh, the Farallon plate had completely subducted uh, along the California border. And, uh, and what, what I mean by subducted is that the, the totality of the plate was consumed because North America was moving westward and the, and the Farallon plate was moving eastward. And at that location, it completely uh, was, uh, uh, the divergence zone was uh, consumed. Uh, at the uh, boundary, and the remnant of that is the San Andreas Fault that you're familiar with. So I, I guess that uh, is uh, pretty much the only existing bits of the Farallon plate lift today. Uh, so with the breakup of Pangaea and the formation of the Atlantic Ocean, the North American plate was born. Uh, bounded on the west by the large Pacific plate, uh, sediments from drainage across most of the U.S. was draining to the west. Um, actually, that should be uh, bounded on the west by the Farallon plate. 
uh, most of those uh, uh, previously deposited sediments were lying on oceanic crust and uh, banked up against the passive margin of the continent like uh, carpets draped up against a wall. So you can have uh, subduction, but if subduction is far enough offshore, uh, you still have a passive margin uh, 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 next to the continent itself. And in this case, uh, at the, uh, uh, the breakup of, of Pangaea uh, in Jurassic, uh, the Farallon Plate subduction was probably uh, four or five or maybe 600 kilometers offshore. So that left uh, a, a considerable amount of marine plate uh, still attached to uh, the North American plate. And so that portion of the, uh, uh, was still passive until the, uh, uh, that portion of the plate was consumed and then it became a very active margin thereafter. Uh, so most of those previously deposited sediments were lying on ocean crust and banked up against the, uh, the passive margin. Uh, uh, and, uh, and, and as the, uh, the subduction zone kind of migrated further and further to the eastward, uh, and eventually it became close enough that uh, it started uh, taking all those sediments that were coming up, washing off of the continent itself out onto that passive margin that we've been talking about forever now, uh, that have lasted for, uh, in that part of the world, over 600 million years, uh, built up over 6,000 feet of sediments, and it they crumple together, just like we uh, normally find at uh, subduction zones. Uh, any sediments that are in that area you can't subduct, and so as the continent is pushing towards the uh, towards the subduction trench itself, it causes all the sediments that are uh, that were laid out on that passive margin to start being squished together and shortening, and as a result of that shortening, they thicken. Uh, into what we now today call the Kootenai Arc. Uh, and it's kind of like uh, taking a rug and, and uh, say a runner rug and putting one end against, uh, uh, against a wall and then uh, taking uh, a and put and you get on the other end of that runner rug and you're pushing it towards the wall and and you're seeing that rug uh, shorten uh, continuously and as it shortens uh, it starts making these folds that occur uh, and the folds become overlapping and uh, get really intricate and that's what we're looking at when we're looking at the Kootenai arch itself uh, so the sediments were tightly crumpled into folds and thrust faults. So anytime that we have uh, folds that overturn and, uh, and become too acute or too uh, uh, steep, uh, the dipping planes become too steep, uh, they break. And when they break, they break into thrust faults. Uh, those remember that thrust faults are uh, the um, head wall moves up in relation to the foot wall. And if it's greater than 35 degrees, it's considered a thrust fault. And if it's less than 35 degrees, it's considered a, uh, uh, if it's greater than 35 degrees, it's considered a reverse fault. And if it's less than 35 degrees, it's uh, considered a thrust fault. And I think this is a good pl uh, place to take a break. So let's take a five minute break and then, uh, then we'll come back, okay? If you have a question, uh, go ahead and ask it. Oh, wait a minute, I don't want to pause share. I want to pause the video.
Professor, did you hear about the sample return mission that the European Space Agency is doing with Mars? No, t tell me a little bit about it. In July, they're going to send uh, something to Mars that's basically going to construct a makeshift launch pad. They're going to find a find a rock that they determine is scientifically valuable for research, and then they're going to shoot it off Mars back to Earth, and it'll be the first launch that'll originate from another planet. Oh, that's that's going to be really cool. Yeah, I'll send you the link via email. Okay, sounds great. Everybody, see that on your screen? No. Yes. yes. No. Well, I mean, what are you talking about? The slide? Yeah, the slide. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. All right. This is uh, the next slide. And so a uh, geologist in Washington and British Columbia identified a band of tightly folded rocks named the Kootenai Arc. Uh, the Kootenai Arc uh, continued from northeastern Washington southward beneath uh, younger and opaque basalt lava flows. So in other words, we lose sight of it because we can't see it in, uh, uh, in the, the deposits of um, uh, actually, Columbia basalts are so thick that uh, can't really see uh, the Kootenai Arc underneath that. Uh, and uh, we lose track of them until uh, they reappear in the Sierra, actually in the Klamath Mountains, the eastern portion of the Klamath Mountains and the eastern portion of the Sierra Nevada Mountains. May have all been part of the same mountain uh, range uh, or uh, 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 may have developed as part of the same process of, uh, of crumpling the uh, sediments that were uh, on that passive margin for all that period of time. Uh, notice to the left here are the uh, subduction zones that occur. These are transformed boundaries between the subduction zones. So we uh, pretty much have a feel for where the uh, uh, subductions were uh, during this period of time. Uh, and of course, next time we're going to talk about the Blue Mountains and how the Blue Mountains came into being. Uh, so the Kootenai Arc and the uh, Sierra Nevada both contain granite. And how did the granite form? Because what we're looking at, of course, is as the Farallon Plate descends under North America, uh, it builds up a tremendous plate pressure and uh, temperatures increase uh, on that descending plate. So when it gets down to about 120 kilometers deep, uh, it dehydrates uh, the plate itself and all the moisture that was contained within that uh, plate uh, rises as uh, superheated steam into the uh, uh, lithosphere above it and melts that rock in the lithosphere above it. Uh, and that rock, uh, once it becomes melted, that melted magma, uh, if, it, if that melted magma finds a pathway all the way to the surface, then it's, it's um, uh, ejected out as, a, in essence, what we call an alkali uh, basalt. And uh, alkali basalts are dark colored uh, porphyritic uh, volcanic rock containing abundant sodium. And sodium and potassium oxides are really important in the melt So, uh, for, uh, for fractionization. So if, if that magma that is rising doesn't find an immediate outlet uh, to the surface and it manages to get in within the crust itself, then it starts to assimilate uh, the felsic material that makes up the crust, and that felsic material within the crust starts mixing with that basalt material, and it forms an intermediate lava. And if it sits there long enough, then a, a period of fractionization occurs. And what that means is that uh, all the heavier elements that make up basalt uh, that precipitate out of the melt at a higher temperature uh, for example, uh, um, olivine and, uh, and um, uh, anth uh, 
Plagic Clay's Feldspar and and uh, I forgot the name of the <laughs> horn blend uh, come out of the melt and uh, fall to the bottom of the chamber, magma chamber. And uh, so that means that all those minerals are out, leaving the rest of the elements that are in the uh, minerals to uh, come out at lower temperatures. And so the next group of rocks that come out are going to be our feldspar, uh, our intermediate rocks, uh, andesite, andesitic type of uh, magma. And it will, uh, uh, those minerals will start precipitating out of the magma, leaving only the felsic minerals behind. And if that felsic minerals behind uh, find an outlet, well, then they're ejected as, um, as um, rhyolitic uh, lava. But if it stays within the uh, within the magma chamber itself, it ends up being granite. So we can go from, from an alkaline basalt uh, to an intermediate um, uh, aphanitic uh, rock or um, uh, uh, phaneritic rock to a uh, felsic phaneritic rock or, uh, or granite. And that's really important because uh, of what uh, uh, what we're going to talk about next in the next slide. Uh, so the, the granites uh, that are remaining or that granitic plutons that uh, uh, remain were the ones that formed the uh, Kootenai Arc and the eastern Klamath Mountains and the eastern Sierra Nevada Mountains. So the, the granites that we see in that were fractionalized out of these alkaline uh, type of basalts uh, that formed uh, uh, about 120 kilometers deep within the lithosphere. And the process is still going on today, forming uh, uh, both the uh, crumpling of the um, uh, crust is still forming the coast range today. And, and of course, the, uh, uh, the down warping of the plate, it gets down to about 100, 120 kilometers deep. And, and it's, those materials are forming the uh, uh, high cascades of today uh, and the uh, Sierra, uh, uh, well, no, not the Sierras, but just the high cascades of today and uh, up into uh, uh, about halfway up into uh, Washington. Uh, the collision between North America and the Pacific Ocean floor crushed the old uh, western margin of the continent. Uh, they, they pushed and crumpled sediments greatly thickened along the western margin of the continent, like we're looking at here, uh, raising a broad welt of early mountains. Uh, the early mountains began to rise in Middle Jurassic time and continued to rise into Cretaceous time, a period of about 64 million years. Uh, those early mountains probably resembled um, uh, the Andes Mountains uh, of South America, which owe their existence partly to thrust faults as well that stack slices of rock along the western margin of the continent. And these early mountains along the uh, Western uh, portion of uh, uh, well, actually Eastern Idaho, or at that time, it, well, it would have been more of uh, uh, West and Central Idaho. Uh, we think those mountains were about 20,000 feet in elevation, so they were quite high. And uh, streams carved those early mountains and created a rugged landscape, most, like for, uh, most likely forested on the western seaward side face. And then the climate uh, uh, inland was uh, certainly dry, much like we see today. So everything, in other words, everything west of Idaho into Oregon was uh, oceanic and anything to the east uh, was uh, uh, coastal plains that led to uh, an inland sea that was around at that point in time. So here is, um, oops, sorry. Uh, this figure is the, the approximate location of the early mountains uh, along the western edge. So 
Uh, we can actually think of the, uh, some of those as being part of that same uh, stretch of mountains that created the uh, 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 the Kootenay Arch. Uh, I don't think there's probably a, a, I think that would be pretty a safe assumption. Um, two major bath lists denote the area of the early mountain range, the uh, the Kinexu batholith and the Idaho batholith. And remember that a batholith is any granite, uh, granitic pluton that is greater or any kind of, uh, of um, um, phaneritic rock or rock that we can see with uh, the minerals with our eyes. Uh, uh, if it cools in place is plutonic and if it's if the plutons or coalesced and greater than 40 square kilometers in size, then they form a batholith. Uh, to the south of the Northern Rockies, which we're gonna be talking about in a minute, uh, in Southern Utah, an inland desert similar to the Namibian desert existed. Uh, so coastal sand dunes of the Namibian uh, deserts in southwestern Africa are close analogs for the setting of the uh, Jurassic Navajo sandstones of Utah. And details of the stratification indicate again deposition in wind forming dunes, some of which uh, must have been of the order of 100 meters high. I want to apologize. I said something wrong back here. Uh, this would not have been a part of the um, Kootenai Arc. Uh, this is actually uh, a part of the uh, uh, northern Rockies and the northern Rockies of that time. And that's really important uh, because of uh, uh, next time we talk, we're going to talk about a big uh, decolumment process that occurred in which uh, huge swaths of this mountain range actually broke loose and uh, slid to the east and uh, forms today's northern Rockies in the eastern part of uh, uh, Wyoming and Montana. Uh, and west uh, west to central part of Wyoming and Montana. Uh, so to the south again, uh, it, it looked like the uh, Namibian Desert. So anything in this anything in this area went the wrong way again. Dang it! Anything down in this area right through here. Uh, is what we're considering to the south. Uh, and it looked a lot like the Namibian desert. So we're looking from the bottom of, say, uh, Utah uh, down uh, to the Arizona uh, and New Mexico area. Uh, resemble the, and this is the Namibian desert to, uh, to the east over here. And so we have the same kind of wind conditions in which uh, winds were blowing from, uh, from the west. And we had uh, uh, ocean currents or littoral currents going to the south, uh, created these huge dune fields like we see in Namibia today. Uh, it was the same type of environment that we saw uh, in uh, Jurassic times uh, in Utah and uh, down into Nevada and uh, New Mexico. And I guess you guys from uh, well, it's just one of you now from uh, Dan's from New Mexico as well. I mean, from Nevada as well, but uh, you're probably familiar with some of that uh, formation, uh, Warren. Pardon me? Yeah. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not from down there. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, I've been there. It's nice. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, well, Arches uh, National Park is part yeah, of it. Yeah, Canyonlands and Canyonlands and all that beautiful uh, parkland is all part yeah. of it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's striking, but uh, it does wear after a long time. You, you get a little tired of all those rocks from Colorado. Yeah, all that red rock. <laughs> uh, in the, well, there's a huge desert. I mean, it was, uh, as we can see in this area, uh, they call it beach sandstone here, but it was uh, basically desert regions. And then to the east of that, we had this shallow marsh that, uh, and shallow water uh, Epiric Sea uh, that was uh, invaded this basin that was uh, called the Williston Basin. 
uh, to the east. So as the land crumples from the west uh, on the on the four arc basin or the four arc side on the uh, in this case the east side of the mountains causes uh, uh, a uh, four arc basin and those basins fill in with uh, water and uh, consequently uh, that water uh, uh, sediments that go into it uh, form uh, either lacustrine or in this case uh, a shallow uh, embayment and uh, uh, these clays represent the deeper portion of the embayment. Uh, these are uh, uh, limestones and uh, 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 silty limestones and limestones. And this area up through here would be um, uh, uh, beach type sandstones and all through here and, uh, and in some cases would be our uh, desert regions. And remember, all this time, dinosaurs moving back and forth across all this. <laughs> we had uh, uh, marine uh, animals living in, in this water back in through here during this period of time. Hmm. So uh, the sea constantly uh, changed shape and size due to variations in sea levels or, uh, or the elevation of land. No, in other words, as the land kept uh, crumpling, uh, it the basins would or if uh, sea levels dropped then the the basins would uh, uh, shallow up again so we have uh, interbedded uh, deposits and interbedded sands uh, or, or uh, limestones with the shell deposits uh, these inland terrestrial deposits included uh, the Morrison formation which is all this area that, whoop, all this area in through here, especially this clay region right in through here, that's all part of the Morrison formation. Uh, <coughs> uh, the inland uh, ter uh, terrestrial deposits included the Morrison formation. This formation is the source of uh, all, uh, a vast amount of dinosaur skeletons that are displayed in museums around the world. Uh, that's what we're looking at here. This is a hip bone from uh, uh, a large uh, sauropod. Uh, uh, just different, actually most of the bones we're looking at in through here are from a larger sauropod uh, that are still in place. And actually this slab has been cut and uplifted and set on edge for you to view. Uh, at Dan Dinosaur National Park. I think you've been there, haven't you, Bill? Uh, the it was close to remodeling last time I went by oh, there. Oh, is that but right? Again now. Yeah, I missed it. Oh, mm. darn. I'm going to get there someday. It's, it's on my bucket list. Um, the Morrison Formation is a variegated and a very colorful assortment of mudstones, sandstones, and limestones uh, that crop out in that in, in uh, uh, across Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and Montana. Uh, the streams that deposited them flowed from uh, flowed east from the highlands that ranged from Idaho into Nevada. So everything that uh, that washed off the eastern side of uh, of the northern Rockies at that point in time. Uh, all those sediments were washing out into this uh, shallow uh, basin uh, to the east. Uh, it seems reasonable to think of the Morrison uh, sediments as sediments uh, that were deposited uh, in a desert because it was essentially a desert type environment because of the huge 20,000 foot mountains that were to the uh, to the west of them were blocking any kind of moisture that would have been coming off of the uh, Panthalassic Ocean at that point in time. Uh, actually, I guess by then we were starting to look at it as being the Pacific Ocean and not the Panthalassic uh, Ocean anymore. I'm just going to go ahead and go on. We got uh, 20 more minutes to go. Uh, if we end early, then uh, uh, if you well, let's just take a break. And if you need to uh, go to the bathroom, this is a good time to do it. Hey, uh, Gib, there's a Pretty good question in the chat, and I'm not sure if you see it. Or not. Okay, no, I can't see the chat. 
Oh, uh, okay. It's from Warren. Uh, where was the Yellowstone hotspot during the Jurassic? The, uh, Warren, the, the uh, Yellowstone hotspot didn't exist at that point in time. It didn't come in until um, uh, Eocene. So uh, quite a bit later. And we're not real sure. Uh, it may have started uh, uh, at, at um, Pell Eocene. Some people speculate that the uh, hot spot at one time was actually uh, over a part of Oregon and was responsible for the Celestia terrain, but I don't think that is probably a, a valid uh, hypothesis. I think it uh, originated. Uh, in the southern part of uh, uh, Oregon and the northern part of Nevada. Uh, Didn't it help form part of the uh, Snake River Basin too? Or is what's that, that? Didn't it help form part of the Snake River Basin or is that debatable as well? The Wyoming, uh, the Yellowstone hotspot. Uh, yeah, we'll, we're really going to go into detail on that uh, when we uh, get into the Basin and Range area, but uh, uh, it yeah, it did help uh, form the the Snake River uh, area because of the plateaus and the in the river cutting through it uh, ended up uh, forming the Snake River and uh, part of the Columbia as well, of course. Okay, I didn't pause that, so I guess we'll uh, keep on going. Uh, so this is, uh, the long drought seems to have continued as the new mountains rose in the west during early Cretaceous time. Uh, the Morrison formation accumulated in large areas of Montana and Wyoming. Uh, so those early mountains looked eastward across arid plains and shallow inland seas and west across an open ocean beyond the western edge of Idaho. Uh, the moving continent continued its movement westward towards two large uh, scraps of microcontinental crust and several groups of islands out in the Pacific uh, that were destined to become the first new real estate added on to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, demolishing the earlier mountains we discussed, the Kootenai Mountains, or actually the, uh, yeah, the, the, whatever that remnant of the Kootenai Mountains were, and transforming and rejuvenating all of that into the, uh, the Northern Rockies that we've just been talking about. So this would have been the same area that we're looking at where the Plutons were uh, in the Northern Rockies, early Northern Rockies. Uh, the first of those exotic terrains were the intermontane terrains. Uh, the very largest of the inner mountain terrains is called uh, Quesanelia. Quesnelia. It was once a large island microcontinent out in the Pacific that lodged against the Kootenai Arc and extended down into north central Washington. Uh, the intermontane terrain is a, a complex mess of separate terrains that assembled in the Pacific to form a microcontinent before they lodged against North America. Remember that terrains consist of rocks uh, related in both origin and um, uh, and are historically bounded by faults, uh, origin and composition, and historically bounded by faults. Um, a microcontinent of or continental island is geologically very complex and contains a number of different terrains, especially the Quesanelia contains all kinds of terrains. Uh, next time, again, uh, well, two times from now, we're, when we get into the Blue Mountains, we're really going to start talking in detail about these terrains that uh, landed in, in uh, eastern Oregon up against that Idaho or the old continental uh, craton, uh, and look forward to that. Uh, the original rocks of uh, Quesnelia were sandstones and argillaceous sandstones. Remember, argillaceous just means a muddy sandstone or uh, ones that can claim, uh, uh, contain uh, about 25% clay particles in it. Uh, probably derived from volcanic islands eroded and deposited between Devonian and Triassic time. Uh, the original, in other words, a part of that continental shell. 
Uh, the original rocks are now metamorphosed beyond recognition, recrystallized in, into schists and gneiss, or schists and gneisses, and schists being uh, uh, the uh, metamorphic rock and schist and gneiss are both metamorphic rock. What we're looking at here is a gneiss, uh, which has light and dark bands. The uh, minerals migrate to light and dark areas. The light, uh, light density minerals go to the light colored areas uh, and basically are feldspars and quartz and the dark minerals uh, uh, congregate together, the horn uh, fields and uh, biotite bicas and uh, all the heavier elements go uh, and form minerals in those areas. Uh, So what we're looking at here is a sheared uh, is a, a sheared gneiss of the inner montane. Uh, so this kind of gives you the idea of what was going on at that particular time. We could have more than one subduction zone, and we did have several subduction zones that were uh, parallel to one another that were off the western coast of, of North America. Uh, so this image illustrates the approach of the intermontane volcanic islands uh, to the ancient margin of the Pacific Northwest. Uh, the Farallon plate is fragmented into two smaller micro plates, each with their own subduction zone. Uh, molten rock from subduction of the intermontane plate intruded into the old rocks of North America. So that's this one here. And then all this slide mountain, uh, part of uh, the deposits in here made uh, uh, is part of the Quasinelia intermontane um, uh, exotic lands. And then it's capped on the, uh, as this moved in, as these islands moved in, they um, uh, sealed off the, uh, this particular uh, subduction zone and uh, killed it. And eventually these islands uh, uh, ended up cramming up against this slide mountain uh, sediments and uh, formed, um, uh, were non-seductible as well and formed uh, the Western part of the uh, intermontane area. Uh, because of the rocks of the intermontane uh, microcontinent were non-seductible, uh, the collision killed the subduction zone when it rammed against the Kootenay Arc. Uh, we think the intermontane trench broke into several different plates and trenches as the uh, most northern plate rammed into the Kootenay Arc. Uh, the smaller plates were separated by left lateral transform faults. Uh, that's what we're looking at here these transform faults, and there was another one up north of us. Um, <coughs> remember that transform faults are the faults that are vertical faults uh, that separate two uh, plates. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, plates uh, that are uh, subducting, uh, the subduction zone is broken into several different fragments, meaning that the main Farallon plate was broken. And wherever the, uh, the uh, separation of the two plates, uh, the two subduction zones occur, we have a transform fault, an active transform fault that is between them, and they slide uh, uh, vertically against one another. Uh, in this case, we're looking at a left lateral transform fault for you guys that are uh, interested in structural geology. We, uh, so we think the intermontane trench uh, broke into several different plates and trenches as the most northern plate rammed into the Kootenay arc. The smaller plates were separated by left and lateral transform faults. The smaller, uh, the smaller southern plates uh, carried the blue and uh, Wallala terrains into southeastern Washington and northeastern Oregon. And next time we will talk about those terrains, uh, or actually um, next week we'll talk about those terrains. For our next lecture, we'll continue talking about 
the Northern Rockies, and we're going to talk about this huge decolumment that occurred uh, in which the, the actual Rockies broke loose uh, and riding either on, a, probably on a cushion of, uh, magma, of uh, granitic magma and slid uh, 100 kilometers or so to the east. So you, you were talking about a, a huge mountain chain once uh, in, the inner montane slammed up against the, the continent. The collision was enough to break this mountain chain loose and a good 10,000 feet of it slid to the east 100 kilometers. I mean, that's just incredible. It's, it really is mind boggling. And, and by the, you know, and we can prove this. I mean, we have evidence to show that this occurred. So we're gonna talk about that next time. And on this last slide is just kind of a, a five minute uh, reconstruction of the plates uh, going from present time backwards in time. So we're, we're going in reverse time. In other words, going from today uh, through uh, the creation of Pangaea, and then, uh, uh, the, in other words, we're going through the breakup of Pangaea into the uh, Pangaea, and then the creation of Pangaea uh, into the breakup of uh, Rodinia, and then into the creation of Rodinia. So I, I, I find it really interesting and a beautiful thing to watch, and I hope you find it interesting as well. Takes a little while to get started. It's dark blue, light blue shallow seas. All this we know from uh, paleomagnetic studies. Uh, uh, we were talking, I think I was talking either to Robert or Warren about earlier uh, today. I can't remember who I was talking to, but uh, asked a question about paleomagnetism and, and where the poles were at the time. And based on the origin, knowing that the poles do reverse every 250,000 years, uh, we still know when they're in normal phase or in reverse phase. And we can know that the, as the magma cools, the iron and the magma will freeze in the direction of the poles. And so by reconstructing where uh, the latitude and, uh, and direction of the poles, we can reconstruct how the, the continents came together. And I think that's just totally fascinating that we're able to do this. So now we've got Gondwana's, uh, uh, the, the land masses together, uh, Laurasia, uh, Laurentia's slammed into uh, uh, Africa and uh, in uh, India, I mean, Africa and South America have slammed into the eastern side of uh, North America. Uh, we can now have Laurasia completely uh, accumulated. And now we're back uh, to uh, Permian and we're um, breaking apart the continents. So this would be pre, uh, not breaking apart, but pre uh, Pan, uh, Pangaea. separation of, of uh, Rodinia, moving back in time. So now we're at Cambrian or uh, late Cambrian and going towards early Cambrian, uh, Silurian actually. Now we're in Nordivision. I just now realized that, I was trying to guess. And that it's just gorgeous the way, and look at these island arcs going through uh, here. It's just incredible. They're able to spot those in uh, little bits of landscape and reconstruct where they were at that point in time. Now we're in Precambrian.
and now we're uh, working towards the breakup uh, of uh, Rodinia, the immediate breakup of Rodinia. Now we're in Rodinia, and uh, this is uh, what Rodinia looked like at that point in time. This would have been uh, Laurasia right there. 